Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, two things. First of all, we will be dealing with the main analysis. Paper one, public administration. Paper two will be done in a separate part. <clears throat> and the good news is that obviously this year's Hubbard paper has been quite, quite easy compared to the general trend which was there for some time. Though I would say it is not easy in the sense that it needs analysis, it needs more of understanding, right? Rather than just what you can say the syllabus, right? Or memorizing the syllabus. So application is there, no doubt. Majority of the questions are application oriented, but the nature of application or nature of questions are designed as per the uh, above average understanding. So paper is easy, right? This is a good news for all the PubEd students, first of all. Obviously, the scoring pattern would also be increasing, no doubt. The marks will be higher compared to the previous years. So we can expect the Achyadin for PubEd, right? Secondly, the way questions have been designed, it has covered most of the syllabus, first of all. Secondly, most of the questions reflect uh, a more conceptual orientation. That means if students have studied it and understood the various aspects or various dimensions and not just you know memorize the facts so they can write it in a better manner. Obviously, if you just know the facts, then after a point of time, you lose uh, the ability to write further content. So that part, obviously, you have to uh, uh, review if you're preparing for, right? the this paper or for the mains exam so the paper is easy scoring would be higher on the usual lines most of the questions obviously are those which are which could be understood by students who have conceptually studied the syllabus also as you know a lot of questions are interlinked so obviously you need to move from one topic to another and try to find out the basic you know links between these topics right so we'll start with without any waste of time uh, let's start with the first question itself. It is quite a usual question, expected. And though they have asked the the more you know the implied aspect of that. So first question is the politics administration dichotomy debate is still alive, right? And that's correct. See, when you uh, go to NPA two, so when NPA two we end with the NPA two, one of the prime aspects of NPA two was that. Uh, is public administration still relevant when the market and the neoliberal mechanisms have emerged, right? So it is obvious that public administration is still is considered to be one of the important academic disciplines and the important system that governs the society, right? So this idea that dichotomy or the, the, the identity of public administration is still relevant, right? Somewhere gets reinforced after the NPA 2. Also, right, NPA 1 itself, uh, though discarded the dichotomy, it highlighted the importance of public administration. So there are some paradoxes here, right? But let's say, how do we write? Obviously, when we think of the uh, idea of dichotomy, it is a 10 mark question. So you have to obviously uh, focus first on defining what dichotomy is. So Wilson's idea of dichotomy was based on the very belief that if administration is made autonomous, it is made free from the influence of the politics, then it can perform better. It can be more efficient in nature. Also, Wilson's core idea that every detailed and systematic execution of law is public administration, it itself emphasizes that what is the role of administration is executive, right? So you can start with the basic idea and then you can bring the perspectives that what exactly the dichotomy means. So there are two, three aspects. One, dichotomy, first idea of a dichotomy, politics administration dichotomy is that, that there are two separate spheres of study, right? And they cannot be, uh, or administration cannot be studied as just a sub part of the political science, as it was presumed. Second, as a, as a, as a system, as an institution, as an organization, they are also separate <clears throat> because one is elected 
another is recruited right the different parameters are used for political process and different parameters are used for the civil services so this is second aspect the third aspect is the functional domain functional domain though overlaps to an extent but still there is clarity that what a secretary would do what a department would do or what uh, an, an administrative system would do and what a political system will do so that also is very clear here that is the third aspect right functional separation and then obviously comes the the intellectual separation what is the intellectual separation that dichotomy somewhere has to be visualized uh, or should be used to visualize the 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 substantial understanding and study of pobad and the substantial understanding and study of politics so academic without intellectual separation is not possible that is when we treat them as two separate spheres of thinking and logic and understanding then only we can visualize them as dichotomy so see a basic idea to bring the perspectives of dichotomy first and then obviously we can bring the logic that yes in spite of the criticisms it was believed that wilson's idea was naive it was uh, immature and why it was immature or naive because later on public policy perspective comes later on simon's criticism comes then uh, the criticism by uh, for example riggs or by robert dal john goss and many of the comparative scholars right like for example dal's criticism comes from his 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 writings on the science of administration three problems so these are the perspectives which criticize the dichotomy right but in spite of that when we think of bureaucracy weberian model or when we think of the ethics in public services today uh, when we talk about the idea of digital era governance or when we you know bring the perspective of new public management or any of these ideas which emerge right either post globalization or you can say just you know in the era of 1940s and 50s even the classical era and even after that so everywhere the basic idea has been that administrative system is or must follow certain set of values certain set of premises like neutrality neutrality obviously highlights the dichotomy a political orientation dichotomy right collective responsibility though with the idea of anonymity again dichotomy later on npm dichotomy right neo weberian state dichotomy so there are various models right which even today even npa3 the dichotomy as an idea did not die down so even today also when you think of the uh, uh, the administration right as a system or as a set of functions or as an academic area of study you always tend to distinguish it from the uh, political system today also whenever we talk about ethics in governance or you know efficiency of administration we always believe that only it is only possible when there is a separation between the politics and administration right various second arc recommendations in india right other reforms commissions they have always recommended that we need to depoliticize administration right we need to make administration more neutral or we need to make it committed to public interest and not to the political system political ideology must not influence administrative decisions right even the civil services conduct rules right or for that matter the code of ethics as desired for the civil servants all of them demand somewhere the or somewhere are based on the assumptions of dichotomy fine so if you had used these ideas you could have written the answer well and that was the answer which was needed fine so let's see the second question <clears throat> formal organizations are made up of informal groups right obviously this is bernard's and simon's view and in fact mayo right mayo was the originator of all this so mayo bernard or simon in fact argyris lickert you cannot outrightly deny these people right all of them somewhere have realized that formal organizations fine they have a limited impact the structure the design the theories oh, sorry the procedures the principles right whatever the classical theories were developed they had a limited perspective of viewing people as the economic rational beings or viewing them as people merely as the 
adjuncts or subsidiary to the machines. <clears throat> but this idea changes once Elton Mayo or MP Foley comes into picture. They are the ones who <clears throat> highlighted the need for a human centric study of uh, organizations or to a large extent the ecological and systems study of organizations, right? Uh, obviously, when they bring these ideas, it becomes clear that the efficiency or productivity or for that matter motivation is not a consequence of material needs, is not a consequence of incentives, economic incentives. It is not a consequence of uh, discipline and control and authority and centralization. It is a consequence of the social, psychological and emotional factors uh, which impact largely the individuals and the groups within the organization, right? So the assumption was that within this formal setup, the legal system that we have designed, there exists a democratic system, there exists a social group, right? And this social group <coughs> has a lot of influence on the people or workers in the organization. So this brings us to a very important idea that, okay, if there is a legal, technical, procedural, formal, structural design, Right? Is it operating as per this design or is it operating as per the social and psychological factor? Right. So here Mayo, Foley, or for that Bernard and all these ideas emerge. So the idea that can formal exist without informal? No. First of all, it is ruled out. Secondly, informal organizations, are they against the formal? Yes. They, they seem to be. And at least that was the realization made by most of the classical scholars. Right? So your Weber or Fiol or Taylor. And many of these scholars, Gulik and Arvind, they believe that informal right would outrightly somewhere reduce the efficiency, the productivity, or the performance of the organizations. Fine. So they did not accept it as it is. Third aspect, is informal always against the formal? No, that is not true. Though Mayo's ideas have highlighted it, that there is a resistance or Taylor's idea of soldering or systemic soldering that he brings, right? It shows that there is a resistance to the formal or there is a kind of you know, uh, uh, neglect of the directions given by the formal system, which is influenced by the informal associations, right? But because informal organizations are spontaneous, they are natural, they are emerging from emotions and social relations need for emotional support, right? They uh, somewhere, okay, not necessarily can or need to obstruct the formal system. They, in fact, can nurture people to accept and be more considerate to the formal system, right? For example, if you say Bernard's idea, personalizing and socializing. So as far as the decisions of individuals are concerned in the organization, right, they keep personal considerations as well as organizational considerations. That means there is, they may, there may not be a conflict, right? There may be a, a relationship. Argyris fusion process, right? A relationship between individual and organizational goal, right? Motivation studies. So obviously, when you think of uh, satisfiers and dissatisfiers, right? Both, or we can say the, the Herzberg's model. So both somewhere are needed by the people. So a part of that can be fulfilled by formal. A part of that can be fulfilled by informal. Fine. And likewise, if you apply this similar idea to public administration, you find that, okay, yes, the lower levels in the organization, they are more uh, 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 responsive to the formal systems, whereas the middle levels and higher levels, they are not that responsive to the formal systems because of the intellectual nature of their work, right? So uh, they are more into, you know, uh, they, they need more like, you know, peer-to-peer -peer interaction. They require more democratic system or democratic uh, ecology to work, right, within the formal systems. So without that, obviously, they cannot work. So formal and informal, right, as per Bernard or Simon, Foley, Mayo, Argaris, and many other motivation scholars, is uh, somewhere, right, uh, uh, having a complementary relationship, right? In fact, Bernard says that formals thrive within the, sorry, informal thrive within the formal, and informal basically vitalizes conditions and reorients the formal system. That means Bernard believes that somewhere the increase in informal aspects like communication, informal relations, uh, social relations, com uh, see, the, the, the uh, motivation beyond you know uh, this uh, material things, 
or contribution satisfaction it could be a model that he brings all of that somewhere or the idea of incentives and inducements right they all bring together the perspective that formal and informal need not be treated as counterproductive but complementary to each other right so that is the idea obviously we can apply this logic very well to the lower level bureaucracy street level bureaucracy where there is excessive subordination you might have heard a lot of news uh, many of the central police forces or many of the people belonging to police forces and law and order systems right they have committed suicide or some of them killed their own seniors or uh, uh, shot their own seniors uh, there is a perpetual conflict at the middle and lower level right it is because of excessive subordination excessive you know discipline that is created and this discipline or uh, or the insubordination which is happening right can be overcome through the informal means right so we can use variety of informal methods as suggested by interpersonal communication interpersonal relations right emotional association you know, you know collective you know activities making the atmosphere of the organization more fear free right so we can do variety of we can follow variety of mechanisms right and combine a combination of material and non material rewards and we can improve this relationship so that is the idea you can go ahead if you've written the answer that's good fine so b that is the question right gray point same thing see upsc's innovation has declined to an extent but still right grape wine is the term used by simon bernard and many other scholars especially we study when we talk about communication right so simon bernard and others who have used this idea even mayo to indicate it to the informal informal communication systems so how informal communication is necessary just now we were talking about right once we have informal fine we can assume that we have taken a positive view that it can be constructive for the organization right but there is another view which says that it can be okay destructive to the formal systems right but it is necessary so the discussion that we have done here in question 2 or b 1b right that same applies to this the only difference is the word grape wine so grape wine are the unstructured informal means of communication right there can be variety of grape wine methods like gossiping is a grape wine right for example casual communication is a grape wine non documented communication is a grape wine or for that matter let us say that uh, a a manager right when he interacts with uh, his subordinates right or with coworkers in a more informal atmosphere that's a grape wine uh, also uh, body languages right symbols symbols like you 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 seem to be angry right now you don't need to write it on paper you seem to be angry so that conveys the idea so there are many ways by which you realize that uh, how the people you know communicate with each other in the organization irrespective of the formal design and the formal method of communication right that is the idea so grape wines are necessary even same question see it's like a repetition so the form of communication which somewhere uh, is not visualized by the organization it is not written in charts it is not designed as per the law it is not part of the standard structure but still it exists and it operates and it influences the formal communication system right for example bernard's idea of acceptance theory of authority what does he want to say he wants to say that your formal authority your formal direction or your formal decision a management decision or manager's decision may not be accepted by the subordinate why because somewhere there are informal factors which are influencing it right so unless a superior understands that a subordinate will accept my authority and only then i'll be able to exercise the authority right so i need to develop a consensus with my subordinate right somewhere i need to have a democratic or more you know a human or humane perspective towards my subordinate on that's the informal aspect so in every organization the informal systems will always uh, improve somewhere the relationship between those who are you know exercising authority and on those it is being exercised 
But yes, like I said, they can be counterproductive also. For example, Mayo has shown they can be counterproductive. Taylor believed systemic soaring is counterproductive. So informal communications may be more like gray points. They may be casual. They may have no structure. They may be you know, just like the Angur ki bail. Huh? That's a great point. So they might move from here to there. They might enter into those spaces which are personal. They may violate privacy. <clears throat> they may uh, lead to you know uh, uh, disclosing of the secrecy or the information of the organization to the outsiders. Uh, they may provoke you know conflicts within the organization. They may initiate resistance to the management policies. And there can be a lot of other consequences, right? Gray points can also uh, erode the trust between the workers or the people, subordinates, and the superiors, right? Because of the, what you can say, the, the false information that might travel, right? Gray points travel much, much, much faster than the formal communication because they do not need to follow any specified route. The formal systems have to follow a route, a you know, designated procedure, but they don't have to, right? And they are more born out of the human sentiments. Also, these gray points are subject to filtering, right? Communication can be filtered and what you get is something different. Uh, manipulation of information. So they are subject to filtering. Uh, they are subject, subject to halo effect. What is a halo effect? Some part of the information which is, uh, we call it as halo effect, right? Or filtering. Some part of the information which is, important might be eliminated and unimportant information might be conveyed or the one who is conveying the information might not interpret it properly and he should he may convey only the things that he understands the rest he may leave right uh, then there can be bandwagon effect right bandwagon effect bandwagon effect is that okay few people right who uh, who may claim to have direct source of information or who may be interpreting an information in a particular way, they might influence the others to accept it in that particular manner. In fact, at the workers' level or at the subordinate level also, you might have elites, right? So these elites can again capture or control this information and selectively release to rest of the organization. In this way, right, the management or the managers would lose a lot of trust within the organization, right? So legitimacy of power and authority would be questioned. And again, further conflicts may create. It may lead to people leaving the, leaving the organization, attrition rate, right? quitting the jobs. A lot of other factors may emerge. Fine. So if you want, you can extend it. But as far as you, know, you have the space and the time, you can use it to that extent only, right? Though we have discussed in detail what could be the possibilities? So you can write your own points out of that. C. So let's take the D. Healthy headquarter and field agencies relationship thrive on effective communication. Again, similar idea. See, so their theme is communication this year. Seems like obviously headquarter and field agencies start with the basic structure of organization, right? We, like we many times we have discussed in the classes also, right? that there is a department or there is a ministerial model and there's a departmental model. There's a secretariat, there's a directorate. The directorate is the actual line. The secretariat works like a general administrative staff. So you have to tell the structure, obviously without that you cannot write. So tell the structure briefly and then talk about secretariat directorate relationship. And then directorate is further divided into an attached office, into a regional office, into local offices, right? or technical offices okay. and likewise. So uh, the headquarter, right? Attached offices, technical organizations which are supporting them and field offices, right? For example, so every structure of the government more or less looks similar. So there are a variety of uh, structures which exist in the government system, right? And one of the priority aspect of this is that how well policies or decisions could be implemented, right? So specialization or general monitoring and control, or for that matter, you know, optimizing the resources or making the subordinates act effectively on the decisions of the superior. Now, these are the basic needs of any organization that has to efficiently function. So this, you can start this way, right? Healthy why? Obviously, what issues will emerge when headquarter and field relations 
or organizations will interact. Obviously, field is more localized. It is susceptible and vulnerable to the local conditions, right? For example, let's say protest. For example, local political conditions, regional demands, right? If you are you know, located somewhere in Northeast region or you're located in somewhere, you know, Naxal affected area or you're located somewhere in more disturbing area, the field offices would have to face the brunt of majority of the public, you know, uh, uh, violence or public opinion. This may not be visible to the headquarter. Fine. So there is a gap in terms of information, data and understanding of the local ecology. Second, the field offices are more equipped to handle technical things or what you can say day to day operations. Right. Whereas headquarter is more concerned with policy or management policy or for that matter, broader guidelines and vision of the organization. So there comes again a gap between the theory and practice of field and headquarter. Thirdly, the intellectual level, obviously, people in the headquarter, they have more access to information or at least so-called theoretical information. They are more well-versed with principles and logic. They have exposure, which is of national, regional or global level, whereas people at the field offices may not have that kind of exposure. So there is a difference in the intellectual ability of both. Right. Fourth, obviously, the, 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 the local conditions are so or maybe so complex, right? That headquarter may not be able to understand why there are delays in the implementation of policies and programs. So this may create a kind of mutual distrust or conflict between them, right? So delays in implementation, success or failure of the policies to a large extent would be affected by a lot of regional factors, which headquarter may not take into consideration, right? Headquarter again is generalist dominated, whereas field may be comprising, like I said, more of technical people. So that may also create a controversy, right? Uh, generalist versus specialist. Also, like, for example, Gulick and Arvik have talked about, you know, small arms, long finger, right? Arms and finger model. Arms and finger model relates to to what extent the field offices or the attached offices are located, you know, uh, regionally far from the headquarter. So to what extent, right, it can be controlled or it should be left autonomous. It also to a large extent depends upon the nature of function they are performing. Obviously, field offices at times need to be given autonomy. Decentralization is a norm and that is why they have been created. But you can understand that uh, we have like discussed many times the model is deconcentration. The field office is a deconcentrated model and not a technically decentralized model. So the delegation of power, the administrative control, the authority, regulation, discipline, all is somewhere consistently under the control of the headquarter. So this also somewhere creates the problem of governance or administration at the local levels, because for anything they have to frequently refer to the headquarter. Both have pros and cons, right? You can write about it. It will give a better answer. In Indian context also, second ARC has highlighted this as a very important issue in, uh, in, in administrative failure, that majority of the uh, structure of governance, right, that is centralized. In spite of having decentralized units, majority of these functions are centralized, right? Any ministerial control, for example, finance ministry, right, now it has a lot of something called economic intelligence units or cells, right, which are operating somewhere around 1995. But then it is controlled by an economic intelligence council in the finance ministry. Right, which is working at Delhi, which is controlling everything from Delhi. For the same way, right, CAG operations or for that matter, election commission. So there are several organizations which could be used as an example where a better healthy headquarter field relationship is better for implementing policies and programs, collectorate and sub collectorate level, collectorate and state government level. See, a centralization decentralization model exists, right? Also, uh, if you are too innovative and you are quite you know, intelligent enough to link it, right? the same way we keep doing discussions in the class many times, right? your paper two idea of, uh, you can say, the territory and function dichotomy, there is an idea, right? That uh, at the district level, uh, the kind of governance we have is territorial, fine. Whereas uh, uh, how we are you know, functioning is basically related to specialization. So we have several organizations but they are controlled under what district collector who is a territorial head. There are functional units, specialized units. They are controlled by their own 
superiors and their own hierarchy, right? But they are also horizontally controlled by the collector. Right? So this can also give you the idea that how the actual governance takes place and that is why the headquarter field relationships may suffer because there will be an intermediate hierarchy to which they have to respond and they may not directly respond to their or even if they're responding to their superiors, right? They will have to respond to a generalist called a collector. So it is up to your imagination and creativity to an extent how you can apply this knowledge, right? I'm not saying that may be the standard answer, but if you are, if you are looking for some brownie points, maybe half marks or one mark more. So you can use it and obviously bring the perspective that this problem also applies to the actual administration. Fine. Question E, media has become more of a societal lens than institutional lens analyze, right? First, obviously this question, there does not need a lot of analysis. It's quite obvious that what is the primary role of media? So start with first the basic idea that, okay, media, why fourth state of democracy? Is it functioning that way, first of all? If not, why? Secondly, media, what is the reflection of media? Media has to bring independent, free, fair, right, news and not just opinion in the analysis. Though media has become more of opinionated today, see, that's the question. The question is not just about bringing society issues. It says that, okay, yes, there has to be an institutional integrity and neutrality of media as a system. But what is happening, right? Now, media is listening to gray points. Just now we were talking about so media, obviously, it has a role to understand the needs of society and highlight those needs. But what is media doing? It is being influenced by these social, cultural, ecological, political, and so many other factors. So rather than putting up a strong stand in terms of its own integrity, in terms of you know, value-free judgment, a neutrality in terms of expression, or working as per the data and the facts available, what is media? Media is succumbing to social, political and other pressures. Media, though, no doubt, must highlight the problems and issues of society, but it should not take sides or neither it should take opinions, right? It is quite clear uh, when we think of the coverage of Manipur wallets. It is quite obvious when we think of the coverage of certain other states where the coverage is too deep and too invasive, right? Whereas neglecting the coverage of other areas. So many of the issues, you can give a lot of examples, right? Don't be outrightly criti critical of the government. But yes, there is quite true that uh, the, the societal lens, right, would make the media more biased. It would make media more, you know, uh, I would not say sensitive, but it would make media more, you know, uh, value-based and prejudiced in terms of bringing the issues which are important and somewhere neglecting the issues that it feels are not important. And many of the factors will drive it, political, cultural, social, economic. Corporatization of media is also one big issue. Because of that, they have to succumb to the political pressures, uh, finances, revenue models, uh, then uh, management and editorial team being segregated, right? Editors do not have much choice today in the publication of the news. It is the CEO or the management which controls this. So there are various factors, right? which have led to this drawback, kindly highlighted. This is more of a GS question. You can write it much better, right? So we have talked about social media regulations, right? Digital data policy, digital data framework, okay, uh, <clears throat> IT Act. And so the very me mechanisms are there, right? Code of Ethics for Media. Uh, Press Council of India has talked about, you know, seven point or nine point Code of Ethics for Media. But obviously this question does not give a lot of scope. So you can just mention them and obviously you can, so over you can, obviously you can, you know, just give a positive perspective that yes, media can be made more responsive and receptive uh, to the social changes, but not be influenced by or biased by the social opinions, right? So that can be a better conclusion. Uh, don't talk about judicial control of media or likewise, you can talk about ombudsman or you can give talk about giving more teeth to the Press Council of India, that will be better, right? Fine. Uh, second, let's see. Question two.
Fine, let's see. Take to question 2A, that's 20 marks, right? Fine. So, this is a usual question. McGregor's theory X and Y provide insights into human motivation at workplace differently. Correct. We have already discussed many times the idea. Fine. So, it is quite obvious uh, that uh, whenever uh, we think of organization or when we think of people working in organization, we always believe that there would be some binding force between them and the organization. Right. One of the important elements of loyalty, commitment, you know, motivation, or you can say enjoying the work that one does is obviously the pleasure or the benefit one derives from the work. So it cannot be just benefit in terms of money. It can be pleasure. But there are two ways to view it, right? One, when theory X, uh, when McGregor feels that, yes, there is, uh, uh, he's basically influenced by Foley a lot and Bernard even to an extent. So one of the aspects that McGregor brings is that, that there is, uh, there is worldview. There are two worldviews, right? To view the organization. What is a worldview? It's an approach. It's a conceptual understanding. It's a philosophical basis, right? So that is the question about. So what McGregor talks about is a cosmology. So what is a cosmology? That's a managerial cosmology. What is managerial cosmology? The way the management philosophy, right? The way or the different basis on which the management philosophy has been developed. So one basis of developing the philosophy or understanding of organization and human nature has been the X. One has been the Y. So he calls this as X and counter to this he calls it as Y. Though he does not believe that they are totally different to each other. Or he does not believe them to be opposite to be understand. Try to understand. It's more like a continuum. See? It's not opposite. It's a continuum. Every organization may emerge this way. And eventually may need to transform to this. Why? Because as the organizations or as the theories help the organizations understand the real nature of human beings, they might be willing more to transform from X to Y. Right? That's the idea. So X or managerial cosmology talks about what is X. X believes that people are same economic, rational beings. They are greedy. They are materialistic. They are motivated by money purely. They have joined the organization for personal goals and not the organizational goals. Fine. They are, you know, materialistic, self-seeking people, right? That is what the code hypothesis is, right? Code hypothesis. So one idea is that. So talk about this idea that what are the elements of code hypothesis or managerial cosmology X where the belief is this. So what are the assumptions? These are the assumptions. People are greedy. They are materialistic. They are seeking money. They have joined the organization purely for personal goals. They are individualistic and they do not want to remain in groups. They like authority. They accept authority. They can accept authority to the extent or to any extent if it fulfills their personal goals, right? That is one view. Based on this view, the classical model of organizations emerge, right? They are not seeking self-actualization. They are not seeking community values. They do not want association, fellowship, all these things even, right? One view says that no, people are, you know, humanistic. They are social and emotional. They are seeking these things in the organization and they are not purely after money. So they are Seeking non-material aspects, respect, dignity, association, mutual relationship, and so many other factors, right, which are more value-based. So the other worldview, that is why, is based on that. So just compare these two worldviews, right, and say that McGregor never realized, or McGregor never felt that this should be taken as totally, you know, opposite to each other, right? Because organizations somewhere work in balance of these two. And that is why he was going to develop theory Z, which obviously he died before doing that, right? Human motivation and personality and likewise various, you know, 
the articles that he wrote or the books that he wrote. So he was uh, a human side of enterprise, industrial side of enterprise, like books he wrote. So he was trying to develop that Z. The Z was the combination, basically. So he realized that the X and Y right, are two set of beliefs, are two set of ideological basis on which we assume that how people need to be managed in the organization. Though eventually most of the organizations uh, must shift to Y because it can eliminate conflicts. It is more about integration. It is more about human aspect, right? So they should shift eventually to that, but it is not an absolute category. That means an organization cannot be absolutely Y and neglect productivity and efficiency, right? An organization cannot be totally X and only focus on productivity and uh, uh, efficiency. So he talks about the somewhere the integration, right? His famous experiment called Scanlon Plan, if you know about it, right? So his famous experiment of Scanlon Plan it has highlighted that how in the long run why would be more effective right without obviously compromising the productivity but why will lead to more productivity whereas x will diminish the productivity and peace in the organization after a point of time right so you can bring this perspective it can be applied very well to public administration to the traditional administrative systems right which have been mostly designed on the basis of x so why factors could be included like we are talking about today incentives, rewards, performance based evaluation, right? Or performance based incentive. We are also talking about like we have prime minister's award, we have public administration award, we have civil services day. So there are a lot of symbolic non-material aspects we are trying to promote, right? Uh, within the civil services, within the lower ranks of the civil services. And this is going to be, or this is going to impact the organization in the long run. So how uh, social, emotional and other relations can be developed without compromising the core purpose of the organization. That is the idea of MacGregor. <clears throat> Though MacGregor could be criticized for some, it's a 20 mark question. You can write brief criticism also if you want, right? Because examine in detail, that's the word. So you can also criticize MacGregor that first of all, uh, the human beings don't operate in these two categories, right? I may have the good and the bad both, right? Herzberg is more logical there. Uh, secondly, obviously, how will managers identify, right, that this person is X type or Y type? Do we have any you know, specific categorization of X and Y? In fact, X and Y categorization may lead uh, uh, to a lot of repercussions and negative consequences for the workers or the subordinates. For example, if a manager is X type, he has an attitude which is more Hitler type, right? Or we use the word Machiavellian attitude. He's more power hungry. So he might not treat, he might not even accept the Y attitude people, right? He might feel they're underperformers and he will remove them. If there is Y type managers and he has X type subordinates, then also there will be a conflict. So McGregor could not explore this idea that is X and Y an attitude, a behavior, right? Or only a set of, you know, practices and actions which managers perform. Can managers uh, be trained or can managers be, you know, developed into uh, a permanent set of beliefs will they acquire a permanent set of beliefs called x or will they acquire a permanent set of beliefs called y fine so x and y need to be used in combination that's the idea this was duly explored by theory z or even you can say people like argaris and others who believe that yes there is a need for you know combining them uh, in fact uh, likert also did not totally support that it will be employee centered model which will work so many of these scholars realize that it cannot be just, you know, people oriented and people centric, right? Peter Drucker has criticized them that merely focusing on human aspect will undermine the productivity and efficiency, economic resources, and this is vital for the survival of organizations. Fine. So that you can write. Fine. This is again the direct question that we have discussed many times. Fine. Let me just clean it. To be good governance adds normative and evaluated attributes to the process of governing, right? Obviously, good governance as an agenda from World Bank, right, has both the elements prescriptive and descriptive. It is instrumental 
and it is normative. That means we also believe that it is the end and somewhere the belief is also that it is a means. That is the idea. See? So you can discuss this. How good governance as an agenda of the World Bank, right? Somewhere it treats not only good governance as means, but it treats good governance as end. And for that, it suggests certain means like free market economy, liberalization of economy, right? Democratic form of government, uh, rule of law, justice delivery, right? And it, it favors certain types of conditions or conditionalities in which the good governance could be achieved, right? Whereas the idea that good governance as per the World Bank's model may be an end, right? But when you think of the developing societies, it may not be just the end as visualized by the good governance uh, model of World Bank, right? For developing societies, good governance or the, the achievement of certain types of, you know, outcomes or certain goals would be means to some greater end, right? For example, we, we may say transparency or technology will lead to good governance, right? So technology will lead to certain consequences, fine? That cannot be called as such good governance because technology can become means or it will lead to certain consequences like transparency. Now transparency is not the end. What is the end? Redistribution. What is the end? Inclusive development. What is the end? Justice, right? So Bob Curie <clears throat> or Ferzaman or Atul Kohli, there are various scholars who have realized, who have you know, supported the idea, even latest scholar Terry Cooper, uh, so there are various latest scholars also who have brought this perspective that see the agenda of good governance and globalization it works it worked together and somewhere the uh, the agenda of good governance promoted the idea of globalization and it comes with certain kinds of do's and don'ts right yes and no so that criteria of yes and no right makes good governance more you know value based with respect to Western models. And that is what the question talks about. Evaluative, right? Normative and evaluative. See, if these things are present, there is good governance. How these things are present? On what idea these things should be present? Based on the Western value system. So when I say GDP should be higher, GDP will lead to what? Economic growth. Economic growth will lead to what? Nothing. Now see, if you know economic growth or free market is the good governance, right? It cannot be totally accepted in the developing countries. So is free market the good governance? Is market-based management the good governance? Is corporate governance the good governance, right? Or if more investment is good governance? No, it must translate into what? Rural development, inclusive development, housing for poor, basic amenities and utilities, right? It must translate into others' ground or whatever, see? It is up to us how we do we present it. So that's a question. You can criticize that idea and obviously move ahead and you can suggest that for us, the good governance is more of a means than an end. As second ARC has highlighted the various elements of good governance, right? And ultimately, what is the consequence for the society? That's important. So whether we are able to manage and tame this good governance as per our desires and our needs, that's essential rather than merely getting obsessed by the idea of good governance, right? It's like saying that if I bought the iPhone, I would become something extraordinary. No, you will not. So that, that the, 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 the acquiring the iPhone or just buying the iPhone, right? The latest model does not guarantee you, know, you the status or the identity probably which you are seeking or maybe the fulfillment or the satisfaction that you are needing. So GDP growth rate per capita income, PPP, index of industrial productivity, or for that matter, whatever reforms we are doing they need to be translated into actual reality point. So that's the question you can bring. Uh, you can do it, write it in a very interesting manner. You can bring the Indian perspective very well. Fine. You can talk about various disparities and regional disparities, which have been emerging because of the agenda of good governance, right? A lot of conflicts that have emerged. So industrial Western industrial model may have created, you know, both uh, positive and negative consequences. Fine. How we can overcome, you can write, but I would doubt that you might have that much of time, but you can still write that, okay, we can pursue our indigenous model of good governance through this business, human development through this, through this, through this. Fine. <clears throat> so that's question to be, right? So let's...
two B we have done fine. Okay. Two C regulatory authorities are independent and effective for controlling service delivery activities, but are subjected to extraneous factors. Do you agree? Give reasons. Yes, obviously. The concept of regulatory authority, it is a 15 mark question. Uh, kindly write it. Right. What is the concept of regulatory authority? How does it come? If you know, it has come because of the emergence of the independent regulatory commissions in the US and the idea of agencyfication. All these students who have studied might be knowing many times and again, we have discussed the idea. So independent regulatory commissions, agencyfication, right? Agencyfication is uh, creating the autonomous organizations. We are creating autonomous organizations, right? Which will be different from the departmental or the ministerial form, right? That means creating directly under a bureaucracy or a ministry, an organization, what are we doing? We are trying to develop more autonomous systems. These autonomous systems would be functioning as specialized agencies. So that is first the idea of regulatory body. These specialized agencies, why they are needed? They are needed because various sectors are emerging under the market mechanism or globalization and neoliberal market or neoliberal system. So they are emerging. So they need to be controlled. Obviously, when the variety of sectors, we see the increasing of private sector or pro proliferation of the private sector, right? It becomes quite obvious that the government's role has been reduced. Direct role of the government, right? From what you can use the word from uh, rowing to steering now or facilitating. So now that role has changed. Obviously, in this change scenario, what do we need? Should we undermine consumer protection? Should we undermine accountability? Should we undermine public resources? Should we undermine inclusive development, right? Should we undermine regional disparities? We cannot. Should we undermine justice delivery? No. So is uh, goods and service delivery important or justice delivery is also important? Both are important. So in that scenario, what do we need? We need to first make regulatory bodies strong, strong enough to deal with the problems of various sectors. And this should not be affected by the government intervention or bureaucratic intervention time and again, right? Many of these regulatory bodies were, now the things have changed a little bit, but they were mostly headed by the career bureaucrats. But after certain recommendations over a period of time, right, uh, they have now moved towards specialized people entering into these systems. So these regulatory bodies, whether you have RBI or you have uh, CBI or you have, you know, NGT or you have, you know, PFRDA or IRDA or many other types of regular telecom regulatory authority of India, SEBI and whatever. So whatever bodies you have now, now they are being headed more by the experts in that sector rather than the civil servants or bureaucrats. So that's very important. So their autonomy has increased, right? Starting from a lot of committees, you know, Tarapur Committee on Capital Account Convertibility, right? Then recently, BN Shri Krishna Committee on Data Privacy, then Financial uh, uh, Sector Legislative Reforms Commission 2013, which was formed, right? It has also talked about the unified regulatory model, uh, you know, uh, uh, integrating various regulatory bodies into one particular umbrella. <clears throat> And Supreme Court judicial interventions many times, right? For example, uh, you know, directing the finance ministry, right, to you know focus on the telecom, uh, telecom agencies or telecom uh, institution, uh, private sector, right, to you know um, pay back the adjusted gross revenue which they have been evading, right? A lot of taxes. So the OECD, right, that is. So base erosion or base evasion and profits uh, setting, right? That's BEPS, BEPS model as enforced by the OECD. So uh, judicial interventions have, you know, also somewhere, you know, directed the regulatory bodies to work in a particular way. So there are a lot of, you know, role which these bodies play. Fine. So they are statutory or they may be constitutional in nature. They may have 
their autonomy in terms of you know formulating their policies formulating their standards and directives they may have autonomy in terms of functioning uh, like quasi judicial bodies uh, they can work as civil court or they may have certain powers of civil court uh, uh, they can you know they generally work on the principles of natural justice you can say not all of them but yes they do have you know uh, circumstantial autonomy to deal with circumstantial issues issues which are you know different in nature uh, uh, or the issues which may be visible in form of a uh, different context right so it can deal with those kind of issues so you can you know highlight this by this is how they operate uh, they may have more legislative accountability they are not directly controlled by the executives fine so their autonomy is to an extent protected fine also see they have to put protect consumer interest and they have to also somewhere manage good corporate governance so they balance both of this fine now the question says so you have given this idea right but they are subject to external factors obviously like i said judicial intervention fine international pressures so when fssi was pressurized by the international agencies or when the indian bodies or regulatory bodies are influenced by the wto right uh, sanitary phytosanitary measures if you have heard about it right or for that matter telecom regulatory authority of inter intervention of the supreme court on net neutrality uh, various committees have also you know recommended like i said you know, over a period of time okay nayak committee damodaran committee right financial sector reforms legislative reforms commission 2013 and uh, tarapur committee before that shri krishna bn shri krishna committee recently 2018 and likewise so there are various committees which have time and again reviewed the role of regulatory bodies and there have been lot of ecological factors right which have pressurized these bodies right maggi issue fssi net neutrality issue telecom regulatory authority of india sebi you know the chief or the bsc chief right <clears throat> being governed by an astrologer whosoever right sebi chief recently okay icsi you see how the corporate governance you know get uh, or influences the regulatory bodies fine banking regulation right of uh, uh, insolvency codes so during covid 19 crisis right the government has restricted the insolvency cases or bankruptcy you know, cases initiation of those uh, so that it does not adversely affect the consumer interest or the trust of the investors in indian economy so as of now you can say that yes social cultural economic global environmental various factors judicial they impact the functioning of regulatory bodies right but that does not mean that their autonomy is totally eroded eroded every regulatory body is working today in the ecosystem of globalization and technology and lot of social development so they cannot be immune from these influences the only thing is that if such influences are negative or they seem to be obstructive to the purpose of the regulatory body right like ta telecom try did or many other bodies have exhibited that way even rbi is not free from government biases so uh, if you can use the idea that yes these regulatory bodies must be time to time reviewed right and we can develop certain kinds of like we have ombudsman bodies lokpal type of body or we can create ombudsman for regulatory bodies or recently government talk, talked about super regulators so we can create these accountability mechanisms from time to time to protect the autonomy of these bodies and also to overcome the drawbacks that might emerge obviously as the regulatory governance will increase as private sector will increase as corporates will increase so regulatory governance has to increase as it will increase right there will be the problems which will emerge right uh, there will be a lot of issues which will emerge whether for shareholders or stakeholders or for consumers and for investors or for certain sectors pharma health education now in many areas we are witnessing this change so you can just write this idea and go ahead with the answer fine <clears throat> that's the answer okay let's take 3a strengthening social audit through appropriate ways will promote inclusive government right obviously what is the idea of social audit all of you know social audit is the mechanism by which the social accountability or public accountability or external accountability is enforced 
on government system. So when government bodies or administrative systems are performing certain tasks, implementing policies and programs, one way of monitoring them or making them accountable and answerable is to evaluate their implementation process through the lens of the economic evaluation or input and output cost or economic process, the expenditure that they are doing and where the expenditure they are doing, that is the work of CAG or formal financial systems. Whereas in 2005, as you know, RTI comes and Narega and comes and likewise, so there are various uh, developmental schemes which emerged and these developmental schemes now or the evaluation parameter was now not just the economic or input cost and output or expenditure analysis. It also required whether it has created the impact for which it was designed that is called outcome analysis or performance evaluation or for that matter effectiveness. That's more non-quantitative. So CAG was doing its quantitative role, right? Or economic evaluation, expenditure analysis, right? Or, and But there was also need for the analysis of the impact of the scheme, right? That is the social impact, the regional impact, the impact on the individuals, the impact on the, you know, various social and cultural elements of a particular region. If assets were created, what were the consequences? So for that, social audit comes into picture, right? Especially with Narega, emergence of MG Narega, the social audit came more into picture. As you know, it was, might be knowing, it was initiated by an NGO in Rajasthan, basically M cases, Mazdoor Kisan, Shakti Sangatan, which obviously led to RTI and social audit and many other developments, right? And there were so many other NGOs also, which were simultaneously working. So civil society basically led to the emergence of this idea. Since then, the government has been pushing the agenda. Second ARC has recommended in varied reports, especially social capital report, that the, we need to you know, strengthen the civil society and we need to strengthen the social audit, right? <clears throat> Based on that, like uh, you say, uh, with Narega, there comes you know, a, a condition that, okay, there should be social audit, which should be mandatory performed. Later on, if you see 2011, 12, most of the centrally sponsored schemes of the government, they come with the mandatory social audit. Social audit is performed by Gram Sabha. Gram Sabha, as you know, after the decline of the planning commission has become the central body for planning and development. Fine. So how this social audit is performed? What is the structure of social audit? As you know, Gram Sabha is a group of people who are the registered electorates in a Gram Panchayat area. They have the power to conduct social audit. Right. Social audit will evaluate the social, cultural and other non-economic impacts of a policy or a program implemented by the administration, right, directly by the people. So external accountability, right. CAG will evaluate, like I said, the expenditure analysis. So social audit became an important method of enforcing public, social and external accountability of these people of these administrative systems towards people. So how it is conducted now? So every state has, you know, they, they, they inform the panchayats or the Gram Sabha of conducting the social audit on such and such date, right? At least in a year, twice it should be conducted. Then there is a quorum for social audit, 10%. Then there are uh, social audit units which are created, right? This was a model of Andhra Pradesh. Andhra, Meghalaya, Jharkhand, they have become quite instrumental in enforcing social audit. Fine. So these social audits now, social audit units are there at the state level, at the district level, right? And sub-district level. Now these social audit units comprise of uh, various experts who now develop a social audit framework for these Gram Sabha to conduct social audit, right? Uh, there are obviously uh, uh, associations made with NGOs, expert bodies, any other ex-civil servant who wants to contribute to this process, support from CAG is there. Obviously, CAG develops the framework for social audit and likewise. So it is conducted. Now, obviously, what are the missing links in the social audit? First is obviously the people who are conducting this audit, they are not very well versed with the nature of programs and policies. Obviously, they can evaluate what is the impact, whether we are happy or not, right? or could have been a better alternative to what they have done. 
was it delayed was it as promised right and they can evaluate all that but they are not capable technically to deal with that right secondly there is no stronger legal framework for social audit fine third there is lack of technological support for example gis data mapping and you know digitization of record or collection centralization of data so a lot of you know issues are emerging because of the uh, use of technology right if it was technology based or if technology was extensively used it would have been more easy social audit data is not visible in the public platform as obviously kerala has done it's making it visible right it is live streaming these social audits grams of our discussions to the people on the website but many of the states have not been that progressive fine secondly uh, sorry next is the the uh, the how to you know balance the economic and non economic evaluation right both must be done in tandem that means cag's performance audit and social audit must be done together only only then it will make sense fine uh, also right there must be uh, you know effective representation in social audit as you say quorum is 10% right so you might feel that it is dominated by elites it may be dominated by few who may be more influential at the local level second year rc has duly pointed out that the decentralization may not lead to democratization so there are local power structures there are local elites there are disparities in power and they are now going to you know create problems for the others also so your caste and many other disparities are visible in the composition of gram sabha as well fine participation of women again that is also a big issue fine then uh, for example the andhra model okay social audit units so how these social audit units should be created there should be a proper framework for that who all will be participating in that how uh, the administrative influence on the gram sabha and panchayati raj institution should be reduced right for example when you say mp mla lat fund right and administration has control over these funds most of these funds can be used for local development also the release of funds through many of the social sector schemes is done through the district administration so you might never find the gram sabha to be neutral or unbiased uh, from the influences of the local administration because eventually they will have to deal with them fine so <clears throat> you can uh, bring these perspectives and if these are the reforms right then definitely we can improve it they can we can have applications for social audit mobile applications right and likewise so various suggestions can be given you can give that right there should be frequency there should be mandatory social audits twice at least a month or once in a month it's a cumbersome process right but making it twice annually is undermining it to an extent fine there should be concurrent monitoring as suggested by second arc right <clears throat> so uh, it can be made effective by certain recommendations and uh, most of these recommendations are practical right they are not just ideal so you could have written this fine uh, uh, then let's okay let's talk about the second question so this is done 3a 3b the development of administrative law in welfare state has made administrative tribunals necessary obviously kindly i'm giving you the idea the administrative law as you know uh, one of the important aspects of administrative law is control over administration administrative accountability so as we are moving towards something called administrative state waldo the use of the term by waldo right or in general right whenever we are moving towards administrative state most of the developing countries uh, they have administration's role as primary in welfare development regulation justice delivery so many areas so when you are witnessing this change right and at the same time you are seeing the emergence of the markets now this creates a kind of dilemma see in one sector one aspect the state has monopoly the other aspect the state is reducing now in any case in any case right the protection or public interest becomes primary so how this public interest could be balanced uh, where state excess is also not required and state's absence is also not totally acceptable fine so how this can be managed that is one concern secondly 
as administrations power increases whether it is social media cyber security motor vehicles act transportation health right regulatory bodies or so many other areas right wherever the expansion of these functions will take place the role of administration automatically will increase or government will increase when the role will increase right the problems of over administration over exercise of authority discretion misuse of discretion or let's say arbitrariness will increase when this will increase right you've seen in covid what happened right so whenever administration gets some you know monopolistic power it tends to overuse it right so violence against citizens or misinterpretation of data and facts excessive use of authority of spa and there are so many examples you can use so when this happens right what is the need the need is how to balance the accountability of administration and its discretion both it needs autonomy to perform functions but it should not misuse this autonomy now that is the idea of the question so then you can write that why the need for administrative tribunals because there are specialized problems there are problems of accountability the administrative functions have become more you know typical complicated they cannot be used or utilized or managed or reviewed by the usual judicial systems there are a lot of finer points which have to be looked into administrative uh, uh, decisions or solutions require flexibility and dynamism so we cannot go always by procedures established by law we can go by principle of natural justice right so you can write this this is the idea obviously they may have certain drawbacks creating more tribunals will again uh, somewhere influence the judiciary it will overburden the judiciary again it will make the process of justice to be more cumbersome more administrative officials or administrators will start performing quasi judicial functions right they are already performing quasi legislative functions under delegated legislation so administration may indirectly get more power right there's a concept called uh, new despotism right which is used by lord hayward so it may be possible that the administration indirectly might now acquire more power so it might enter into so the elements of francophone system correct right they may enter into this and they will make administration more professional more you know uh, uh, smart and more skilled but at the same time they may give them more power and autonomy considering there is information asymmetry there is power asymmetry in our society this society is more or less still dependent on the administration and government and that is a drawback so you can bring a lot of examples here this is very interesting you can write it in a better